All right, let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, giver and perfecter of our faith, we thank and praise you for continuing among us the preaching of your gospel for our instruction and our edification. Send your blessing upon the word which has been spoken to us and by your Holy Spirit increase our saving knowledge of you that day by day we may be strengthened in the divine truth and remain steadfast in your grace. Give us strength to fight the good fight of, by faith to overcome the temptations of Satan, the flesh, the world, so that we may finally receive the salvation of our souls. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Okay, so in the sermon today on 2 Thessalonians 2, which gives us some very distressing details of what the end of the world is going to be like, I thought I would just dogpile on to that some more distressing details in what I consider to be a passage that is a clear cross-reference to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And as a clear cross-reference, you'll note that they work together, and you're going to note that some of the themes here in Daniel chapter 7 have cross-references in the book of Revelation, especially that really, really scary passage Revelation chapter 13 about the beast and the dragon and all that kind of stuff. And over and again, I I note, and I'll just kind of reemphasize this idea, bad teaching on the eschaton gives anxiety. The Bible doesn't give us anxiety when we consider the details. And it's not that the details are not awful. They are absolutely distressing and difficult details. But always the emphasis is on what follows. And so it's as if, the best way I can put it, is it's as if that Christ, in his wisdom, has chosen to allow sin to run its course. And we know this of the devil. And in fact, this is a fascinating passage. I wasn't planning on it, but let me pull this up. I'm going to duplicate this tab. Isaiah chapter 14, in this interesting prophecy that is, you know, really has in mind you know, an earthly king, but also kind of pulls in the, the, the real issues regarding the devil himself, we get this very fascinating text. Consider then, this is, a, this is shooting past the human, human being that is uh, being spoken of here, and, and, and also directly hits really the true nature of the devil, as Isaiah 14, 12. Oh, how you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of the dawn. How you are cut down to the ground, you who laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mountain of the assembly. In the far reaches of the north, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. Now, let's be sober-minded about this, shall we? Is this not every three-year-old when they're having a temper tantrum? Right? Right? Is this not you and I when we are so upset because we didn't get our own way? Or is that just me? (laughs) Right? We are the most like the devil when everything is about me, 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 I, 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 I. And as I like to say in the corporate world, there is no I in team. Right? There is no I in team. And so you'll note then that what is the opposite of this mentality of this way of thinking the opposite of that is loving god and loving your neighbor serving your neighbor for your neighbor's sake so that the person that you see is not yourself you see your neighbor and his needs and so and christ in in philippians 2 exemplifies that beyond all reason but you're going to note then that in our Epistle text in 2 Thessalonians 2, we have this picture of the man of lawlessness, and this man of lawlessness sounds so much like the devil from Isaiah 14 that we have to kind of get what's going on. And so the lawless one will be revealed, 
And uh, it talks about, this is, so listen to the way, so the rebellion's going to come, this is the apostasy. The man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. That's just nuts. I mean, isn't this like the plot line for like every bad B-movie villain? Right? And so God, for whatever reason, and he hasn't given us the reasoning, he has made it clear he's going to let everything run its course as far as sin is concerned, so much so that this man of lawlessness will literally be activated by, you can almost think of him as like the devil incarnate, and the, the whole world is going to come under his dominion. And I do mean that. The whole world, we'll see that in Daniel 7. And for a season, Christ is going to permit this guy to totally win. It's almost as if, and I have to put it in these terms, no human being would be able to say, yeah, well, well you never let us actually run the place and you know, go, go at it really the way... If it, we never reached our potential. Humanity is going to reach its full sinful potential at the end of the world. It's, it's, it's as if Christ is going to take all the restraints off and everything is just going to be nuts. Just bonkers. It's going to be bad. Right? So it's on this I want to dogpile from Daniel 7 and you'll see why it's a cross-reference and then we'll kind of flesh this out. So Daniel writes, in the first year of Belshazzar, the king of Babylon. What a great name. I mean, you know, name your kid Belshazzar. He said, yeah, where'd you find that name? Oh, it's a Bible name. If it's not a good one, <laughs> it just sounds cool, you know. <laughs> anyway, yeah, I agree. Much better than Nimrod. Yeah, yeah. If you want somebody to be picked on and bullied for the rest of their life, name him Nimrod, you know. Anyway, so in the first year of Belshazzar, the king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions of his head as he lay in his bed. Then he wrote down the dream and told the sum of the matter. Daniel declared, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heaven were stirred up, uh, stirred up the great sea. And four great beasts came up out of the sea, different from one another. And so you're going to note here something, and this is one of the kind of the themes of Scripture. Fast forward to the end of the book of Revelation. What's in front of the throne of Christ? Huh? Well, yeah, they're there. The four creatures are there. And also in front of him is the glassy sea. Okay? So one of the, one of the themes of Scripture is, is that, you know, it's that when the sea is storming and windying and all this kind of stuff... This is, this is chaos. This is, you know, bad forces are at work. And at the end of the book of Revelation, you have these four creatures there. Well, except for kind of one of you, but you'd have these creatures there. And then and also you have this glassy, calm sea. It almost makes you want to, you know, go grab a swimsuit and maybe it's like an infinity pool, you know. Yeah, sit there with the chaise lounge, with one of those really cool Mai Tais with the umbrella and stuff. Yeah. Just relax. It's this you know, picture of peace. So, you know, eschatology, you have these, these tumultuous themes followed by the peace and the calm that comes by Christ's victory over all of that. So the four great beasts came up out of the sea, different from one another. First was like a lion, it had eagle's wings. And I looked, its wings were plucked <laughs> off. And it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man. And then the mind of a man was given to it. And behold, another beast, the second one, like a bear. It was raised up on one side. It had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And it was told, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I looked, and behold, another like a leopard with four wings of a bird on its back. And the beast had four heads, and, had, and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast. Terrifying, dreadful, exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. And I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another horn, a little one before which three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn 
were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. Now, if you know your book, the book of Revelation, this sounds a lot like what we see in like Revelation 13. Let me show you at least the idea here. And, this, and so Revelation and Daniel go together. Revelation 13, 1, I saw a beast rising out of the sea, ten horns, seven heads, ten diadems on its horns, and blasphemous names on its heads. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard, its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. Interesting, you know, you see, kind of, kind of roll some things up into this thing. And, um, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth, and in the, to it the dragon gave his power and his throne and his great authority. Oh, the dragon gave it to him. Right? So he's sitting there going, well, we all know who the dragon is. And one of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed. The whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, who is like the beast and who can fight against it? And so here, you, in the book of Revelation, you kind of get this, this unholy trinity of the dragon, the beast, and the whore of Babylon, you know, all together this unholy trinity. And, uh, and you, you can see then how this then is a direct cross-reference to what we're seeing in Daniel 7. So this, this last beast, you know, it, 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 uh, it, I consider the horns. Behold, there came up among them a horn, a little one, before which three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. The horns were eyes and his mouth speaking great things. We learn from Revelation these are great, bold, and blasphemous things. So and as I looked, and this is you're going to note then. So here we've got this picture, and it's like, ah, strong, iron teeth, and this stuff, and it's, it, 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 all this anxiety. And then you see what Scripture does, all right? Gives us a picture, gives us all the gory details, and now comes the thing we should focus on. Not the gory details. Watch this. So as I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancients of Days took his seat. Ancient of Days is going to be God the Father. And his clothing was white as snow, the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames. Its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him, and thousand thousand served him, ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment, the books were opened. All right, we know what that is. That's the day of judgment, right? I looked. Then, because of the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking, and I looked, the beast was killed, its body destroyed, and given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. So here you got this thing that just shows up, this powerful, mighty teeth of iron, thrashing and destroying and stamping and all this kind of stuff. And no sooner is it described than, yeah, it was killed. It was killed. Its body turned over to fire. Well, that was fun. That was great. Yeah. And so you know, that's the theme. So then I saw in the night visions, behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. He came to the Ancient of Days. Ooh, I, I bet you I know who this is. Who do you think that is? <laughs> it's Jesus, right? It's right here in the book of Daniel. So Jesus, the one like a son of man, he came to the Ancient of Days. God the Father was presented before him. And to him, the, uh, the, the one like the son of man, to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. His kingdom, one that shall not be destroyed. And so it's as if what we're, what we're really looking at in our world, if you consider the temptation of our first parents, Adam and Eve, Humanity's fallen to sin. The temptation being you'll be like God, knowing good and evil, and us coming under the dominion of darkness as a result of it. It's as if the devil's end game, for real, is, to, is this coup d'etat to take the kingdom from Christ and have it for himself. And so 
I mean, and when we consider like, you know, World War II, you know, the Nazis, nuts, man, absolutely bonkers. I mean, Hitler was about as insane and demonically so as any human could possibly be. And what does he do? He goes, he, he takes and he occupies all of Western Europe with the exception of the UK and Switzerland, right? And we all know how this ended up for him. Really poorly. Really poorly. And that being the case, it's like, what was the point of all of that? Because human history has written about this guy that he was absolutely just bat guano crazy. He was just nuts. Does anybody think that, Luther, that, that, that Hitler was, you know, the example of like sound mental health? No. And so what's going to happen then is that, you know, the world going through the cycles that it goes through, the next time this happens, or sometime in the future when this happens again, there's going to be somebody about as mentally stable as Hitler, animated by the devil, and he's going to succeed not in taking Western Europe, he's going to succeed in, like, taking over the world. It's going to be a lovely regime. Lovely, lovely. I think if you read the book of Revelation, it makes me wonder if like the preferred method of death for Christians is going to be beheading because it talks about all the people who are beheaded who stand before the throne of Christ. That has not been in human history like the preferred method of killing Christians, but that is mentioned as a uh, thing. So, I mean, so it's going to be just awful, you know. It's gonna, it's gonna, this guy is going to make Hitler look like a schoolgirl, you know. You know, you know he, he just wasn't ambitious enough. You know, not, not even close. And so this is, this is a global thing. But here's, note where the emphasis is on. The kingdom's given to Christ. Given to him by God the Father, the Ancient of Days. And his dominion is an everlasting dominion. So the devil can rage. The devil can scheme. The devil can figure out a way to take over the whole world. Who cares? Because the kingdom's been given to Christ. And Christ is going to permit this for just about that long. And then it's all going to come to a screeching halt. Screeching. And at least when that fellow goes, we will not have the problem of like, did Hitler really commit suicide or not? Is, was he really dead or not? We'll have a definitive answer. Christ himself is going to kill him with the breath of his mouth. So the emphasis, again, is not on the details. The details are there to let us know. Listen, something bad's coming, but this is what you should expect. So as for me, Daniel, my spirit was within me was anxious, which is kind of a normal thing. When you read eschatology in the Bible, it is not an abnormal thing to sit there and go, whoa, that's dark, that's scary. So the visions in my head, they alarmed me. So I approached one of those who stood there and I asked him the truth concerning all this. So he told me, and he made known the interpretation of the things. All right, so these four great beasts are four kings who will arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and ever. Okay, so note. All right, these are four kings coming out of the earth. But, but, the saints of the Most High will and shall receive the kingdom and they shall possess the kingdom forever and ever and ever. There's where the emphasis is. Yeah, 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 yeah. These are four beasts, but the saints are going to win. So then I desired to know the truth about that fourth beast, which was different from the rest. Exceedingly terrifying. It's teeth of iron, claws of bronze, which devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. And about ten horns that were on its head and the other horn that came up and before which three of them fell, the horn that had eyes and a mouth that spoke great things that seemed greater than its companions. As I looked, this horn made war with the saints and prevailed over them. All right, so here's the playbook. Are you ready? This guy shows up. He's going to make war with the saints, and we're going to lose. Is everyone in this? That's the playbook. Yes, <laughs> you've already been signed up and you can't get out. <laughs> okay? So, <clears throat> as Maximus would say, so in the midst of the battle, if you find yourself in a wheat field and the sun is on your face, 
you're already dead. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So this is, this is a glorious battle. We're going to be brutally, brutally manhandled. It'll be like the Patriots versus whatever team. You know? <laughs> yeah, the Vikings. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. That, well, that's painful for some people here, you know. So, yeah. Uh, you, you get the idea. It's, it's really that bad. All right. Go it's, Pats, go. Yeah, go Pats, go. I mean, do you guys remember that, like, dark day on Super Bowl history when, like, the Patriots looked like they were going to actually lose the Super Bowl? Remember that? Okay. I was so excited. I was gleeful. I was sitting there going, I was going to watch this and just sitting there going, yeah, yeah. And then with like two minutes left, they scored like 500 points, right? <laughs> it's like Brady turns into Superman. Okay. That, he, he is the man of lawlessness. <laughs> He's the goat, greatest of all time. <laughs> <sighs> <laughs> 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 I did not do this bunny trail. Okay. <laughs> Bruce is all, this one's on you, man. This one's on you. Now, all that being said, though, you, you kind of get the idea. So the playbook is this. We're going to lose. Is this current cursed creation the thing that we're going to inherit? No. So Christ has basically said... The devil can have it. He's going to let it run its course. The plan is he's going to wage war against the saints and he's going to prevail full stop. You sit there and go, but, 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 but. Listen, this is all going to burn. It's all going to burn. Do you you not know that? Your inheritance is not here in this current cursed creation. Let Let me fast forward a little bit to the end using 2 Peter Shall I? Second Peter chapter 3. Starting at verse 8. Do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises, some count slowness, but he is patient toward you, not wishing that anyone should perish, but that all should reach repentance. This is absolutely Christ's will. This is really why he's being patient. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and, when the, and, and the heavens will pass away with a roar, the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, And the earth and the works that are done in it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for the and hastening the day of the coming of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn, but according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Cool. All right. So we're sojourning here. This is not our final destination. And if the devil wants this, he can have it. The thing is, he doesn't have you. Because it's not God's will that any of us should perish. He's been patient towards us and working repentance in us and faith so that we will trust that we will be forgiven, reconciled to God by what Christ has done for us. And so you'll note then, the assurance then that we have, the hope that we have, is beyond this existence. Now, to somebody who's an unbeliever, this is all you got. This is it. YOLO, right? You only live once. So they're going to hang on tight to all of this stuff. But when... The final countdown starts whenever that is. I don't know if it's going to be on Thursday or if it's going to be 2,000 years from now. It's none of my business as to when it's going to go down. But when Christ has determined, no, so Christ says that there is a day that has been fixed by the Father. This is not a movable date. This is a hard date in human history. And it always has been. 
that as things progress towards that date and as we get closer and closer, there are certain milestones to expect. And all of this has been determined by God. And that being the case, there's not a thing you are going to do to be able to stop it. But we're going to, we, you know, Christians are going to be martyred. I know. The devil's going to take over the earth. Yeah. So what? To no avail. He doesn't win. He gets exactly what he wants, and then the whole thing just comes to an end. Full stop. So, coming back to this glorious text, we are told, this horn made war with the saints and prevailed over them until, and that's your big word, until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given for the saints of the Most High. So, this horn prevails against the saints, then the day of judgment comes and God is the judge and the judge goes, I rule in favor of the saints. And we all go, ah. <laughs> right? In other words, that last touchdown that he scored, was, it didn't count. You know, because the judge rules. No, 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 that was, that was, it didn't work that way. They win, you lose. So, till the angel of days comes most high, and then the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. You're going to win. Christ is one. You don't need to sweat any of this. So he said thus, As for the fourth beast, there shall be a fourth kingdom on the earth, which shall be different from all the kingdoms. It shall devour the whole earth, trample it down, and break it into pieces. In other words, the globalists are going to win. Right? Oh, yeah, that's what they say. That's, the globalists are the ones who are going to fix everything. And by the way, when you consider the theology of the so-called Christian globalists, holy smokes. I mean, you could not be trying harder to lay the foundation for this fourth beast if you were trying. You know? Have you all seen the Netflix documentary, The Family? You should. It'll scare you. Okay. Yeah, you should watch it. Just watch it. And I will say this, that... Uh, I can confirm that, the, that, the, that this group exists. I have run into members of this group who have openly discussed with me their plans. And their goal is to create a global Christian government. Ew. I know. So, yeah, just watch it. If you have questions, come to me. We can talk. All right? So the globalists are going to win. Brexit, it won't last long. <laughs> you seem disturbed, Bruce. Even <laughs> okay, I'm gonna bunny trail. Even without, <laughs> even without the power of Antichrist in our sinful fallen nature, every time humans have tried to establish a theocracy, mm -hmm. it has been blood up to your hips. Yep. But, but, the, but we finally have figured out how to do it right, Bruce. We're, we're going we're to do it right this time. You see, true Christian theocracy has never been tried, just like true communism has never been tried. <laughs> All right. Note, I just read the text. Yeah, yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Listening and I hear what you're saying, but no, I have, I have a question. Uh, we belong to a, a, a congregation, I don't need to mention the town, but my wife and I are both involved with Lutheran for Life. And uh -huh. I'm a little bit involved in politics, and sometimes I get frustrated why people take no action on their beliefs. Yeah. And what you're telling me is they're the ones that got it right. I am in the dark. In the dark regarding what? It doesn't matter. 
the, you just said. The globalists have it right? Well, no. No. But we want to save as many people along the way. Define save. Because I used to work for Focus on the Family. Oh, we were going to save everybody. How? By making a memorial. Okay. Okay. All right. If we're going to talk about saving people, number one, number one that, it's above my pay grade. Christ has to save them. Yep. My job is to preach the word in season and out of season. And it is through the preaching of the word that God makes Christians. Yep. Now, what has been disappearing with alarming frequency within the visible church nowadays? The word of God. The gospel itself. And where, there is, where people are attending places called churches where there is no word of God preached, where the gospel is not proclaimed, where people are not called to repentance, are there being Christians made? No. No. Yeah. So, so here's the idea is, is that coming back to our epistle text, what are we called to do? Stand firm, hold to the traditions, word and sacrament, and do your good works. And so the thing is, is that when evil comes up, all right, and we'll note that in history you can kind of see this. You see the rise of Hitler in the, in the post-war, in the you know, World War I era, in that decade after. And you know what the church did? They stayed silent. That's when they should have been most prophetic. Say, this guy is evil, this is wicked, this is sin. But you know what they did? They blended Nazi ideology. Many churches did. Blended Nazi ideology with Christianity. All right? And they came up with the, the German church movement, if you call it. And they replaced, they replaced the crosses on the altar with swastikas. In, a living, in living memory, for the last 15 years, the church in America has done the exact same thing. Uh-huh. You know, both for Trump and for Obama. The, the only thing is, which sins were we going to justify to push the agenda that seemed best for us. Yeah. So we're talking about serial, you know, they both are disqualified under, or under 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. Don't be deceived. And every time the Bible says don't be deceived, guess what? Because you're going to get fooled if you don't watch out. Yeah. You know, these people aren't Christian. You go down the list of these unrepentant, defined sins. We have a serial adulterer in the high office. Narcissistic one, too. Well, but, but he was replacing a serial earth-worshipping, you know, globalist. Yeah. They're disqualifying on different ends and just pick which church is okay with which one as opposed yeah. to holding them both up. There is a line of evangelicals. I'm trying to witness to atheists sometimes, and, and they're like, look at all the evangelicals who are okay with Trump doing all these things. Why aren't I okay doing all these things? Well, it's hard to preach the gospel on that. Mm-hmm. And see, so the thing is, is that... Um... When the right-hand kingdom abdicates its responsibility and gets in bed in the left-hand kingdom, bad things happen, period. We should be speaking prophetically to both Republicans and Democrats. Instead, because we are signed up as members of one party or another, oftentimes we're willing to be silent as Christians because we recognize, well, it would, it, would, it would be better to have our guy rather than the other guy. G.K. Chesterton's quote. Societies, was this Luke Chesterton or Lewis? Societies don't differ on which things are sins as which sins are acceptable. Boy, I don't know if that was Lewis or, Ch- or Chesterton. I like the quote, though. Yeah. So the job of the church is to not pick a side. Uh, in this bipartisan thing, but to sit there and say, Christ says, the word says, repent. And so the sins of Donald Trump are glossed over. And have you seen the woman who is his spiritual advisor who is now on staff at the White House? I, I'm going to say this publicly, and boy, I probably will regret it. As soon as I saw the news that Paula White was on staff at the White House, I thought, good grief. The horror of Babylon has just appeared on the scene. That's how evil this woman is. Her theology is so whack. I mean, this is a woman who exploits the poor 
and exploits minorities and makes herself rich, basically saying, if you give thousands of dollars, God will bless you. And she's been doing this for decades. And she's like the chief spiritual advisor to Trump. Nothing good can come from this. And I don't care if you're a true-blooded Republican or not. I used to be the treasurer for the Republican Central Committee in Southern California for the congressional 43rd and 44th districts down in Southern California. Mary Bono was one of the people I worked with. I get it, but it's like, why are we being silent about this? And if you speak up, you know what? You're going to be shouted down by Christians. But in the time that Hitler was coming and rising, it was obvious what he was going to do and what he was about. And if you weren't sure, all you had to do was read his book. Do you think that Hitler hid his agenda in Mein Kampf that he put it in code? He spelled it out in exact language what he was going to do. And when he came to power, you know what he did? He did what he said he was going to do. And where was the church? There were few, and I mean this, few who were speaking out against him. You think of Herman Sasse. You know, this guy, I'm surprised he wasn't martyred. But the confessing churches, they had to go underground during the Nazi regime. And Heinrich Himmler, if you haven't read his, you know, the book that came out a few years ago on Heinrich, the biography on Heinrich Himmler, he made it clear that once we were done with exterminating the Jews, we were coming after the Christians. He said that publicly. But a lot of Hitler's early appeal was against the rampant immorality going on, say, in Berlin. Mm hmm. Yeah, more like San Francisco. Yeah, the burlesque shows and everything else. Yeah, yeah. every brand of sexual immorality and godliness you could, you know, and so he yep. was the lesser of two evils until he wasn't. Yeah, but is it the lesser of two evils to say we're going to close the brothels and the burlesque shows? Oh, and then we're going to exterminate the Jews. Is that really the lesser of two evils? How are you defining evil at this point? Right, he, but he gained his yeah. a lot of his initial support on, on was right. the family values vote. Uh, yeah, exactly the conservatives, and then after the after World War II during the Nuremberg uh, Nazi war trials, what were the German people saying? We were duped. This guy was a madman, and we had no idea. We're not culpable. Talk about shifting blame. You guys voted this guy in. Are you kidding me? All right? So note then, when we talk about the proper distinction between the right-hand kingdom and the left-hand kingdom, left-hand kingdom is politics. And the job of all governments established by Christ, and they all are established by him, is for the purpose of punishing the evildoer. And that's their job. They are given the sword for that purpose. They're to keep evil in check. And the government has gone wrong when evil is touted as good. And don't think for a second that only one party is capable of doing that. Both are in this nation and both are presently doing it. And where's the voice of the church saying, you got to stop. You want to know where the church is? They're totally in bed with American politics. It's sick to watch. It's absolutely disturbing beyond all reason. So then as Christians then, we are called, and this is where it gets weird. The book says we're going to be, they're going to, the, the, this thing is going to wage war against the saints, prevail upon them. You're going to see in a minute, it's going to say that this thing is going to wage war with the saints and wear them out. Okay. What's our job? Our job is to be worn out and to lose. And you're not going to be worn out if you're not in the fight and if you're not speaking up. So despite the fact this is all going down, 
You're supposed to stand firm and speak the truth in the midst of it, to confess even in the face of a losing battle. You know, which is fun. You know, so I, I always like to say, you guys might have the opportunity to come visit me in prison before I'm executed. <laughs> yeah, but you get the idea. Yeah, I think about the fact that, you know, such a large percentage of the YouTube videos that we put out on a weekly basis, YouTube immediately demonetizes them. As soon as we hit publish, they are immediately demonetized. Yeah. Could you say before, you know, as far as what's, what you just read here, though, started, you know, right at the time of Christ. Yeah. I mean, I mean this battle has, we're living this battle. It's, yes. As we go along. Here. Right. Okay. And, and the intensity of our losing <laughs> will increase as the day gets closer and closer. And, and this, by the way, is not a bad thing. If you've noticed in the daily readings in November as we get to the end of the church year, um, the daily readings, we're now in Jeremiah. Okay? Jeremiah is the prophet that God sends as like the last guy before he says, enough, I'm taking you guys out of Israel, and you're sending you off into exile in Babylon. All right? In fact, God, when he calls Jeremiah, tells him, nobody's going to listen to you. <laughs> Yay! Okay? What was Noah? According to Peter, Noah was a preacher, a herald of righteousness. How long did he preach, according to Genesis? 120 years. He's the worst preacher ever. Okay, 120 years, and the only people he converted was his own family. Okay? But did God's word return void? You got to understand this, is that when the scripture says you preach the word, and you proclaim the truth, and you confess the truth, even when it's in season or out of season, that sometimes God sends his word out for the purpose of bringing somebody to repentance. Sometimes he sends his word out for the express purpose of hardening their heart and judging them now in, temp in temporal time and making their eternity sure. That's a scary proposition. But the thing is, it's not for you to decide or me to decide what God's word is going to do. Period. So you preach the word. The word says you need to repent. The word says you're a sinner. The word says Christ has bled and died for you, so you need to repent and you need to be forgiven. And there comes Ahmed, and he says, I kill you! I kill you! For saying that. Has the word of God returned to him void? No. It returns to him. It has accomplished what God set it out to do. Oh, and you get to come with it. I desire to depart and be with the Lord, which is better for me by far. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So don't you get it? How did Christ defeat the devil? But dying, okay? Don't you get this? Your life has already been purchased by Christ. You're not your own. Christ has called for you to take up your cross and to follow him. So his battle plan for victory is what? Your demise. He's going to save you through death. So stop fighting it if the time comes and you are given the privilege of confessing Christ in the face of death, then you are blessed beyond all reason because the scriptures say so. Embrace the blessing and do what Stephen did. Pray for those who martyred him. What kind of battle plan is this? It's the one that wins. Read the book. Right? Put some bone, back, backbone in you people. All right. So, so that's for the fourth beast. There should be a fourth kingdom on the earth. Different from all the kingdoms. It'll devour the whole earth. Trample it down. Break it to pieces. As for the ten horns, out of this kingdom ten kings shall arise. And another shall arise after him. And he shall be different from the former ones. And he shall put down three kings. He shall speak words against the most high. Hmm. Okay, I see, I see who this fellow is, right? And he shall wear out the saints of the Most High. Get out onto the field. 
but we're losing. Exactly. Get out there and lose. <laughs> but I'm exhausted. I get it. Go get more exhausted. <laughs> it's the Bengals. <sighs> yeah, okay, so premillennialism, which, by the way, the Lutheran confession, confessions explicitly rule out. That's like an eschatology forbidden by Lutherans. If you're a confession of Lutheran, premillennialism, gone. It says, okay. So, and, and here's what it comes down to. When you get into the book of Revelation, it talks about the reign of Christ as lasting a thousand years. Well, let me ask you this, all right, real quick. If I were to uh, get an actual photographic depiction of the devil right now, is he a literal dragon? No, that's just a symbolic thing. All right, um, this beast, is it really a beast? No, the beast is the symbol for it, right? So when you read the book of Revelation, you note something interesting about apocalyptic literature. And that is, is it uses these really dramatic word pictures. These are word paintings, if you would. Kind of scary, very vivid and stuff like that. But it's all symbolic, all right? So when you read the book of Revelation, when you get to the thousand years, is that literal or symbolic? It's symbolic. It's symbolic of the time of Christ's ascension, until the time of his return. Now, people who believe this, they are called all millennialists. You don't believe in a millennium. <sighs> no, I do believe in a millennium. We're in it presently. Okay? Premillennialists believe that we are not in the millennium yet, that the millennium is coming. All right? And that what will happen at the end of time is that Jesus will secretly return either seven years before the beginning of the millennium, three and a half years before the millennium, or just before the millennium. So you got your, you got your uh, pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib people. And that that seven-year period, right before the millennium and Christ's reign on earth, is going to be really wacky, haywire, and all this kind of stuff. But they're hoping, they're really, they're betting all their chips on the premillennial rapture so that when all this goes down, that they don't have to experience the tribulation. Yeah, no. Does that model have five or seven comings of Christ? I can never be sure. It's, it's a lot. It's really a lot. Okay. And see, the problem is, is that when you do the math on the appearances of Christ at the end of the world, he only comes back once. Okay, so if you've ever had the unfortunate experience of watching one of those Left Behind movies, uh, I do not recommend that. Okay, then you'll note that there's something really weird going on. All right, but the th note the text says here this thing is going to wage war with the saints and prevail against them and wear them out. I don't know if we're going to be prevailed over and be worn out, doesn't that kind of mean we're here? Okay, I know it's not rocket surgery, and maybe I'm being overly simplistic, okay? But the way I read eschatology is our job is to lose. Our job is to suffer. Our job is to be persecuted. Our job is to speak the truth in the face of all of this, knowing full well that we are going to get slaughtered. Because the text says, the saints will inherit the kingdom and they will possess it forever. So go ahead take my life. Jesus is coming in five minutes. You enjoy your time of being top of the heap, devil, because you, well, oh, sorry, four and a half minutes now left, you know, so enjoy it while you can. Yeah, and he's on his way. If you strike me down, I'll become more powerful than you can possibly imagine. Wrong. That is so out of, wrong. No, no, you cannot do that. <laughs> Quoting Ben Kenobi here. How dare you? <laughs> Somebody in the Alethea service quoted him too. I'm thinking I'm having an inspiring thing. So I consider this present suffering is not worth comparing to the exactly. glory. Exactly. Which will be revealed to me in Christ. Right. So all this is going away. And by the way, if Christ tarries for another 2,000 years, 
A hundred years from now, how many of you are going to be here? <laughs> None of you. <laughs> yeah, Betty White. She, yeah, she, yeah, she was. She was ninety years old when I was six. You know. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. All right. All right, so this, this is inspiring battle plans here. So he shall speak words against the Most High. He's going to wear out the saints of the Most High. He shall think to change the times and the law, and they shall be given into his hand. And listen, for a time, time, and half a time. That's it. That's as long as he gets it. It's a fixed thing, and it's, it's going to be all over by then. So the court then shall sit in judgment, and his dominion shall be taken away to be consumed and destroyed to the end and the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms of the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the most high. His kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom. All dominions shall serve and obey him. In other words, kind of think of it this way. You're worried about the globalists, right? I don't particularly care for them myself either. Okay, so they're going to win. But all they're really doing is laying the foundation for the real global government that's coming where Christ is king over the whole earth and the devil and all of his minions are gone. I can live in that place. I'm I'm a full globalist then. I believe in the global kingdom of Jesus Christ after the day of judgment. After, not until until then, right? And so you get to reign forever and ever ever. And ever with Christ. And there will never be in that new earth that's coming a time when the tabloids will write about the leader of our kingdom that he did something salacious or scandalous or that there's some political brouhaha and all kinds of corrupt politics is taking place in his... None of that's not, not at all. In fact, I'm kind of thinking, in a world where there is no sin, how boring will it be to be reigning in a kingdom like that? What we'll have to do is we'll have to watch the news every night informing us of all the great things that are happening. <laughs> right? Yeah. It's a bumper crop again this year. You know, kids, uh, they're all getting A's in school. No detentions, no tardies. It's just awesome. And no weeds in your garden yet again. Bummer! <laughs> Mm-hmm. Daniel's one of the later books written. Yeah. How far back does this idea of the believers? I'm just looking for like saved by grace through faith in the Old Testament. Yeah. Without going to the promise of Abraham thing, because Romans has done that to death. But this the Yeah. The, the, those who are holy. Yeah, the holy ones. How far back does this? I've never done a study on that. That's actually a compelling question. Not a bunny trail. No, it's not. That's actually that's like that'd be a cool question to answer. I have not even considered it. Yeah, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, question. I've heard it a couple times in Psalms. Uh, yeah. So. Mm-hmm. But not all. Of it. Yeah, I, I, hmm, I think if I'm remembering properly, there's only a handful of places where you're going to hear believers referred to as saints, and and then that's fully developed in the New Testament. So what Daniel is saying here makes perfect sense for a New Testament believer, but I don't think would have made as much sense for an Old Covenant believer like it, like it does to us today. What was the original question? Uh, the, the, con- the word saints. Um, how, you know, how, when, was that, when did that start being used in the Old Testament for people who were believers? I'll have to get back to you on that. Wow. Yeah. That's, That's a great question. It really is. And it's not a bunny trail. Do that next Sunday? Maybe, <laughs> maybe it depends. You know, so there's, there's no telling what we actually do in Bible study any given Sunday. <laughs> yeah, sometimes I show up for the Sunday school class in order to learn what we're going to be talking about. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Two and a half years in Leviticus. Yeah. <laughs> I, I want to set the record. Yeah. Um, so in the, in the New Testament, the, the, the word for saints are going to be the hagioi, hagios, the holy ones. And then uh, in the Old Testament, kadosh is going to be your base word for holy. 
uh, then used uh, in, a, in a sense for uh, you know, people in that sense. And so the idea then is, is that saints are those who have been made holy. And so how have we been made holy? By the blood of the Lamb, by Christ bleeding and dying for our sins. Not because we pulled ourselves up by our bootstraps and we've earned our... No, no. Romans is very clear that the righteousness that we have, it was actually given to us as a gift. The gift of righteousness, the free gift of righteousness is the way Romans puts it in. Uh, chapter 5. And so this righteousness, this holiness is a gift given and by faith. But these folks in the Old Testament were given the gift of faith also. Yeah. Yes. So it was a gift. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. In fact, that's kind of the whole point that Paul makes starting in Romans 4 and 5. That, um, that the, the, the covenant of note in the Old Testament is the Abrahamic covenant, which is a unilateral covenant. And that the Mosaic covenant, which shows up 430 years later could not you know, nullify or add to the covenant that was given. And that covenant was a covenant based on promises, which requires faith. And so in Romans 4 and 5, he makes that very clear. And then you have your cross-references in Galatians 3 and 4 that kind of bear that out. So, uh, so then the idea then is, is that every human being who is saved, whether they live prior to Christ's incarnation, death, and resurrection, or after his incarnation, death, and resurrection. Everybody's saved by faith. So if you're on the other side of it in history, rise the side where Abraham is, then your faith is in Christ in the promises that have yet to be fulfilled. And us on the other side, our faith is in Christ in the promises that he has fulfilled. And then we all have the same set of promises, and that is salvation and inheritance given by God as a gift reconciliation with the Father. If you, O Lord, kept a record of wrongs, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared, the scripture says, the psalmist says. So our, our hope and the promises we hang on to are for the forgiveness of sins and reconciliation and an inheritance given as a gift, not earned. Right? So all that being said, you guys now have spoiled the end of the movie. You, you know how everything's going to go down. You're going to lose, I'm going to lose, we're going to get worn out, we're going to be waged war against, and we're going to lose brutally, and that's how we win. Everyone, everyone in? All right, let's put our hands in the center here. We'll <laughs> go fight, win. All right, I mean, lose, go fight, lose, go fight, lose. All right, All right we'll pick this up next week. <laughs>